for surgery specialty services across kaveri hospitals in trichy with an excellent support by the administration and the management first i request to dr ramasamy hod and senior consultant in orthopedics kaveri hospital at trichy to deliver his talk on uh, orthopedic services during covid times over to dr ramasamy thank you thank you very much dr chokalingam and good evening to all the delegates and the faculty uh, good evening to dr suresh now i am uh, sharing my screen now uh, the orthopedic services during covid 19 times so what we did exactly in the initial part of the pandemic and what we are doing now so i will try to summarize within 10 minutes and try to give an idea of what we went through and what we are going through now so from march 22nd 2020 the focus of our services uh, uh, was divided into three categories the first one was emergency services second one semi elective and third one was selective elective so emergency services were a must so somehow we had to deliver these services so how we managed to do that and apart from managing or apart from providing emergency services we also slowly started operating and doing some semi elective services and in the current 3 or 4 month period we have started doing elective surgery also now we had seven members in our department including two post graduates and we split ourselves into two groups team a and team b now in the initial 3 or 4 months when the lockdown was very strict uh, we were also not having any clues every week we were getting some guidelines government was providing a gu guideline hospital was providing a guideline and whatsapp was providing uh, the final guideline uh, so because of this confusion we divided into two teams so that at least one team will be safe and we had uh, a shift of uh, one week so team a would be working for a week and taking rest and then the team b will be working so this is how we managed the initial period and the problems that were met with by the patients and the surgeons are enlisted here so the patient had a lot of dilemma initially they were, they were difficult to choose a right time to go to the opd or to seek the advice of the doctor in terms of emergency so initially whenever we saw a acute fracture they didn't come <coughs> early normally a fracture would have presented within say 8 hours or 12 hours or maximum 24 hours but they were presenting very late so the patient had a lot of confusion then right hospital most of the hospitals were shut down but thankfully kaveri was giving its services both covid and non covid part and so the this the public gradually uh, got to know about the services of our hospital then right doctor choosing the right doctor was also a problem because most of the outpatient clinics were shut and the patients did not or the attenders they did not know where to take the patient so kaveri uh, the paramedical team and and the pro team were giving information on various digital platforms about how to seek a right doctor for opd and how to seek a right doctor for inpatient services then right precaution obviously government was giving good guidelines and the hospital was also providing the precaution uh, the guidelines for precaution to the patients who are inside the hospital the attenders the attenders were restricted uh, they were all screened for fever and only then they were let in now transport obviously during this period the patients and the attenders had to get e pass and the hospital uh, authorities and the doctors were very uh, uh, cooperative in issuing them letters to get e pass then right approach uh, although patients 
got hold of us in casualty and also in outpatient uh, the telemedicine we started at the initial part of the pandemic helped very much and we had a lot of patients contacting us through uh, telemedicine and most importantly uh, uh, i will come to that in the next slide so again now it's a surgeon factor now as a surgeon so we didn't close our opd so we had shift uh, of a week by team a and team b and in those periods uh, the 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 members of within the team were rotated so that opd services was not at all disrupted then we we uh, saw that we took time in assessing the taking the right patient for surgery we took time in assessing them uh, both in terms of covid and non covid status then we chose the right treatment for example for a fracture for which we could have normally operated on we tried conservative conservative method because the initial part of the pandemic was uh, the panic was so high that the patient also opted for non operative treatment now coming to the surgical part uh, we operated on the right patient and uh, with right indication and we performed surgery particularly fracture neck tumor and other essential services uh, we carried we carried on and the precaution uh, we always relied on chest ct and uh, rt pcr which might have been uh, you know dealt in detail by the earlier speakers and we gave them some period suppose if the patient was negative initially we uh, try to uh, quarantine them and operate as the period went by once it was negative by rt pcr and uh, chest ct we started operating and for those patients who who had a positive covid status uh, we wanted uh, a repeat rt pcr after 5 days or 1 week according to the physician advice and then we took them up for surgery now coming to some example so this is this red arrow shows that these patients presented in the covid period so this patient had a shoulder fracture scapula fracture clavicle fracture along with that severe chest injury with chemotherapy and this man was 69 years old and this ct scan shows the fracture pattern of the ribs and uh, this is this x ray shows the icd in situ and this patient we can see that uh, okay uh, so this so for this patient we did rib fracture fixation so that we could improve the breathing capacity of the patient actually if if you have i don't have the initial picture here but the fractured rib was indenting into the thoracic chest and it was causing lung compromise so that was relieved by this fixation and here you can see that the patient is walking um, even in the immediate post op period now this is the post op x ray now x ray of another patient another chest injury with proximal humerus fracture you can see the uh, terrible fracture and that has been fixed so in in addition to managing the chest injury we had also managed a difficult proximal humeral fracture because if we don't fix it this will definitely go into non union now again here you can see the patient who presented during the covid time with non union and if you ask her to wait until the pandemic completes or gets uh, uh, the pandemic goes away it will she will break the plate so we had to do this fixation and this was a sort of semi elective fixation where we removed the plate did bone grafting and used a locking titanium plate now acute osteomyelitis this was an young boy who presented with acute osteomyelitis of the left proximal humerus the mri picture here is showing a good signal intensity and here we can see first pointing after doing a drill hole into the proximal humerus and this is the thick pus so these are all uh, some of the emergencies we operated so another emergency so here you can see that a supracondylar fracture in a child a grossly displaced fracture 
its absent pulp. And here we operated along with the vascular team. The orthopedic fixation was done with KYS. Vascular team did their bit of vascular reconstruction. And finally, the limb was saved. Now again, this is a semi-elective scenario. Here you can see that there is a gross fracture subluxation of the wrist. And this was during the COVID period. And this was adequately debrided and fixed. This was an open fracture. Now, coming to the lower limb. And this is uh, the one of the commonest injury that we see in the normal orthopedic practice. That is intracapsular fracture neck of femur on the right side. And this was managed with a hip replacement, total hip replacement. And this was a very elderly lady. And this boy, he was an adolescent boy. He had a distal femur fracture, proximal tibial fracture. And uh, this was a open grade one open fracture. And he had a severe swelling of the thigh. There was some uh, doubt about the vascular uh, uh, situation. But um, the, uh, RT, uh, <coughs> the CT angiogram was normal. Hence, only orthopedic fixation was done. And he ended up having a good result. Now, another bad fracture. So here, the pulses were intact. But the distal femur was broken into pieces. And this was managed with internal fixation. Now, coming uh, to knee again, here, this is a case of polytrauma, where knee, there was injury to the knee and injury to the wrist, and both were managed with internal fixation. Now, coming to ligament injury. So this is the MRI scan of the knee joint. And this MRI scan is showing anterior cruciate ligament tear. So this young man presented during April-March period. And we had postponed it for a couple of months. And as the pandemic was uh, you know, progressing and prolonging, we had to operate him in the middle of the pandemic. And this man underwent arthroscopic anterior cruciate ligament fixation. And this is the post-op picture. Now, coming to distal part of the leg. Now, we have covered the upper limb. Now, we have covered the lower limb and coming to the ankle and foot category. Here, we can see a non-union of the tibia with a broken nail. And this is a sort of semi-elective or you can even call it as an urgent surgery because a person cannot have both of these, broken nail and a broken bone. And this was managed with open reduction, removal of the nail, broken bits, and then uh, fixation again along with bone grafting. Now, finally, uh, so this patient, so you can see this, this is a normal tibial x-ray, but this patient presented with acute sepsis on the medical side. And upon evaluating him, we found out that this patient had acute osteomyelitis. This was an adult patient who had acute osteomyelitis of the tibia and ankle. And the, the, the way he did, the, why did he develop this uh, acute osteomyelitis? The reason was uh, three to four weeks ago, he had a corona. And this man was a diabetic also, young man, diabetic, on insulin, developed the corona. And he was treated, treated elsewhere with significantly high dose of steroids. And once the steroids were stopped, and I think he was on oral steroids when he presented with this sepsis. The sepsis, it was very difficult to find out. And because of sepsis, uh, he, he was very bad. He was, at, he was in ICU. Then we operated upon him. We did uh, a window, curatage. We let out the pus. And finally, we had him on, we had him on antibiotics for nearly six weeks. In spite of that, he has developed acute, uh, the chronic osteomyelitis. Now, acute osteomyelitis, even after drainage, has gone into the stage of chronic osteomyelitis. So this is an example of unlimited steroid usage because of COVID uh, situation. So this is the sequelae of COVID that we dealt with. Thank you very much. <coughs> 
Thank you, uh, Dr. Ramsamy, for uh, an excellent uh, illustration of the spread of cases which were, uh, uh, which were operated during COVID times. Uh, it is interesting to note that uh, we had to deal with infections um, and uh, also trauma. And you also gave an uh, excellent example of a steroid which masked the infection features. Uh, we had to use uh, advanced investigations such as MRI which showed the use of clinical skills in diagnosing such conditions. We'll have a question session at the end. Uh, please stay with us. And I will request uh, our second speaker, uh, Dr. Skanda, which is a HOD of plastic surgery and microsurgery uh, at the Kaveri Hospitals in Trichy, uh, to give his talk on uh, the uh, microsurgery uh, among, uh, during the COVID times. Thank you, Dr. Skanda. Over to you. Very good evening to you all. Thank you for sparing your valuable time to listen to the short presentation. How did our department, plastic surgery and microsurgery in Kaveri, manage to cope with something that has changed the entire world? At the end of this presentation, it will give you an insight on to how we managed to not only cope, but continue to excel and do extraordinary work, even in the toughest of times. When we started the pandemic, it was a very scary experience. We did not know what was happening. We heard reports of people falling ill in France and Spain, beds overflowing, and we heard the worst. But then we realized as things went on, fear of the unknown is the greatest fear of all. But once you face your fears, you actually tend to cope with them better. So once we actually went into the pandemic and understood what was actually happening, it was much easier to deal with than to watch endless reports on the media. So another saying goes, we do not fear the unknown but we actually fear what we think we know about the unknown. So that is much worse than the reality. The reality is actually far better. So as surgeons, it is a problem. There were a lot of times where patients turned COVID positive despite being RT-PCR negative. It was a very scary experience. But despite all that, we realized that once things started progressing, it was easier to manage and to understand and to cope and to stay safe. This is our war. And if we don't fight it, who will? This is something that we have trained for our entire life. This is what is there in the Hippocratic Oath. And if we run away, how do we deal with it? How do we deal with ourselves? So this is the thought process with which we went into the pandemic. This is a very famous statue of Rodin's The Thinker. This is probably reflected uh, my thought process at the end of the uh, first lockdown. So... Uh, the thought is, so many cases may be elective, but are we really being fair to the patient? See, this is what we are meant to do. Now, if we don't do now, how do we restore the continuity of services later? How to earn back patient trust and relationships cultivated over several years? And uh, it's a very honest problem. See, it begins as a logistical problem trying to postpone surgeries, but later fear starts seeping in and you start, it gets initiating a negative feedback mechanism, which is very difficult to come out of. And ultimately, it becomes a much bigger problem. It becomes a problem of finances and of survival. Now, plastic surgery is a very different speciality and we have a very unique and peculiar set of problems. Most of our procedures are long procedures. We don't have too many very short procedures. And again, it's a gray area. There are not many procedures other than burns that are life-saving. They are predominantly limb-saving procedures. And you know, where there is a limb-saving procedure, always the easier choice is amputation. So plastic surgery, again, is a speciality with multiple choices. There are many easy options available. So sometimes you can go for a salvage. Sometimes you can amputate. Sometimes you can go for a microvascular free flap. You can wait for three months, put a graft. But will you do what is best for the patient at that particular time? Plastic surgery again has one particular problem. We use precision optics such as loops and microscopes and it is an absolute torture using uh, uh, with a protective equipment using any of these optics and they get completely fogged. And it's a question of priority. Can it be postponed? In plastic surgery, there are genuinely no true emergencies barring probably a replant or a revascularization. Patient will they accept? So these are the thoughts that go through our minds. Now, this is a real torture. You can see this is me putting up uh, the loop and uh, with, a, uh, with a thick mask and whatnot. And you can see the loop is completely fogged. You cannot see anything through this. And how do we cope with all this? Worked around. We use the yellow halyard masks. I had put the fogging just to demonstrate. But the halyard masks have an absorbent layer which absorbs the sweat and fog. 
we used fans directed at the face we used microscope lenses to cool down the optics we directed the fans at the lenses we slightly lowered the ot temperature so that it doesn't fog and uh, i started using what are called head mounted lights i have smart lights which are featherweight and they are gesture controlled so they don't fog much and it improves the visibility so when we started examining patients what did the problems we face they are large wounds they are complicated dressings again travel is restricted so patients found it difficult to manage plastic surgery is one of the few specialties that is least investigation dependent and most dependent on direct examination now when you have subtle problems you cannot make out through a teleconsult it's very very difficult i personally feel telemedicine is a fallacy as far as plastic surgery is concerned at least for most of our procedures i'll illustrate how this is a mgr's famous song kannai nambade unnai e maatrum so i'm showing you how a uh, direct examination and how we actually do it and makes a huge difference see this is my friend's kid whose finger got stuck in a door when you see a picture like this you see a pulse ox probe which uh, is showing hardly any saturation it is very scary and most people on seeing this picture will think it needs an emergency intervention but then i dealt with it at a different way when i saw the patient directly put it on a doppler there was a good pulsation and there was a fairly decent capillary refill so the direct clinical examination suggested a conservative approach this settled beautifully with no issues and it is a timely decision whereas something which is aided by a distant examination would have probably led to a decision which is not correct at that point of time now when we use infrared you see that there are a lot of patches there are a lot of ischemic patches and after 4 hours you see that the flap is slightly dark but it's very difficult to make out with a photo this is the photo sent from our post op ward but when we went directly and examined with the thermal camera you see the entire flap is ischemic so again at follow up what were the problems that we had and the, the, our dressings are all huge dressings and complicated dressings so many people who are unfamiliar do not accept it's very difficult for them to understand our dressings so what we did was we reduced the frequency of dressings we just made the patient come once weekly again arrange for e-pass and those things and we ensured the completion of care all my patients were given my personal number to contact in an emergency so the patients never felt that they were alone at any given point of time and that someone would actually listen to them and once the continuity care was ensured we were uh, word spread that we were always available and i am very proud to say our entire department has been available every single day from march lockdown or otherwise and we have not suspended our services even for a single minute this is a cl classic picture sunny liston getting knocked out by mohammed ali so as they say when the going gets tough the very tough get going so this this uh, covid pandemic brought out the best in our department and i'm just going to showcase what we did so this is our statistics we had we have done as you can see more than 1150 surgeries in the last 7 months and 2100 op numbers and procedures and the 32 free flaps with a success rate of 93% is pretty much on par with any center uh, anywhere in the world so let me just show you case what all we did and some of our remarkable stories in this covid time but then we release a look at the smile on her face her life is given back do you think it is fair to wait for this patient for everything to settle this is something for all of us to think this baby again similar problem one of the very big centers were operated the lip just opened out on the fifth day then child was denied a revision because it was a covid time and uh, nobody to operate but then they came to us totally shattered family such a disfigured horrible looking child the magic of cleft surgery only the slight deformity of the nose gives away that such a severe problem this was a very special birthday this mother spent the child's first birthday with us one of the most touching moments that i've seen in the last 8 years one another baby again such a small cleft lip why should she be denied treatment you see the result that we are able to achieve we have done so many cleft lip and palate covid or otherwise now this is a cleft palate again gray area it's not a life saving procedure what's going to happen at the max the child is not going to speak normally that does not matter to us but it matters to that child and to that family so, 
than a palate repair child is absolutely normal now when you get a mangled limb like this it is easier to amputate you spend less time in the hospital you spend less time in the ot but shouldn't we do something else isn't it our responsibility we first debrided and discovered with a cross leg flap and beautifully salvaged this fellow will be walking soon another similar case with a mangled limb which has been revascularized you see that uh, implant i mean the vein graft is about to get exposed this is after debridement and a microvascular free flap has come to the rescue and a perfect result in a long term follow up another diabetic foot it is going to be acceptable even if we do a baloney amputation isn't it easier isn't it less troublesome doesn't it make things easy but we think differently this is a chimeric microvascular free flap we have not only covered the defect we have filled it up and when you see this patient walk all of this trouble is worth it they thank you every day for doing something like this again a heel defect very simple to just graft why not do just graft and get away with it but when you give a result like this you give a sensate free flap you give not again large heel pad raw area in a young man why not amputate why not graft isn't it easier can we take the simple way out this has been reconstructed with a microvascular rectus femoris flap gives a thick padded heel something which is cushioning him every time he walks and this is a well settled end result it was a large cancer defect i should mention our onco surgeon dr anis and team for the fantastic work we have done lot of work together it's easy to just you know push away these patients for radiotherapy but we have done so many cancer reconstructions this is a pec major flap not only do we give cover but excellent aesthesis so let us take the difficult way and give better result now this is one of the most challenging cases this is limb saved with revascularization then a child had a nerve sciatic nerve loss so will he walk again was the first question will he walk normally again this is the child seen with the nerve loss you can see a high stepping gait due to sciatic nerve loss and this is the magic of reconstructive surgery with a nerve graft he is running in fact his mother says she is not able to control him and look at his sensation a child who had absolutely no sensation is just just withdrawing the limb so much sensation he is running this is the miracle of microvascular surgery now this is one of the magnum opus this is probably the best case that we have done in so many years just watch the short video and enjoy this video it will explain everything we did a finger replant in a 11 month old baby just watch such a fantastic procedure and something which could have easily could have taken the easy way out amputated this is a record breaking procedure i just want to thank a very special team without which all of this is not possible i just want to mention all of them my team of consultants uh, dr vishal dr adil and dr murli 
and uh, my uh, department uh, duty doctors dr ashik and nakshya i want to mention all of them individually and my team uh, starting from kirtana my secretary jessie um, uh, sheila subitra and radhika they are among the most selfless people you can encounter because they are not just risking themselves they are risking their entire family but not on one day have they ever hesitated to do what we ask they have come despite everything and uh, really blessed to have a team like this and this is the wonderful ot team that we have and headed by exceptional anesthetists who have never refused even a single patient all of all of us have worked with great danger to our life to our families so very many thanks to all of them very special thanks to our management for being very supportive and giving us whatever we needed in this tough time uh, great thanks to all of you for sparing your time i hope you found the presentation eye opening in a lot of ways let us remember that impossible as said by maharishi ramana maharishi means i am possible and at our department covid or otherwise we continue to make the impossible possible thank you very much for your time thank you thank you dr skanda thank you for excellent presentation and the overview of uh, the plastic and reconstructive work uh, which you have uh, done during this uh, covid times with an excellent team support um please stay with us for uh, the question session uh, we would like to uh, hear from you uh, with the questions and answers now i would request dr hari mayappan to go from extremity uh, uh, and operate on them uh, orthopedic surgeons or plastic surgeons uh, we do worry about covid contracting us but uh, ent is really uh, going into the tiger's uh, mouth you know i think hari mayappan uh, has been uh, exceptionally uh, Uh, giving an excellent service uh, for uh, ent patients and let's uh, hear from him about what his department has done during this covid times over to hari mayappan hari are you there uh, yes sir yes sir yeah Just please go over to you over to you yeah One second, sir. Just... Can you see, sir? Am I audible? You are audible, Harry. You are audible, and we can see you. And you have to start sharing your screen after yeah, just... you are ready. One second, sir. Just... Screen sharing is disabled, sir. One second. They need to update. Dilip. 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 Can 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 you make Harry co-host? Yeah, we can see, sir. you should be able to do now hari yeah yes, sir so now we can try sir yes sir excellent happy evening to one and all uh, thank you sir thank you for that one that uh, as you said i aerosol procedures we are fully exposed and uh, what we did in our, in our hospital kaveri hospital in this tough times those are the experiences i will be sharing you now so we the ent surgeon uh, had a high chance of uh, aerosol exposure not only in the surgical cases whereas in the opd cases also so we don't have a privilege in uh, maintaining the social distancing with the patients so we are forced to uh see and not in the way for the patient's care and uh, there was i would say for instance a patient uh, coming with the impaction of the foreign body in a valicula so that's a real nightmare for an ent surgeon so he has to introduce a scope and then uh, visualize the foreign body and retrieve it in a opd so we have to be geared up for that and then that was a real challenge we faced in the covid days so moving on to the related to the surgical practice in the the impact of the covid uh, in ent surgeries uh, we can just classify into two ways that is one is 
ENT pathologies in post-COVID patients. ENT pathologies that got triggered in post-COVID patients. And another one is a late presentation of cases uh, due to the fear of pandemic or due to the lockdown, COVID lockdown, where the elective patient presented us in a, as an emergency basis, emergency or with the complication of the disease. So mucormycosis. This is an opportunistic infection. As I mentioned earlier, that is the post-COVID, the patient uh, ENT pathology, the most important and the fatal one, deadly uh, disease that is mucormycosis in a post-COVID patients. This is a, a big concern in COVID days and a brief introduction about the mucormycosis. Mucormycosis is an uncommon life-threatening uh, infection that occurs mostly in immunocompromised patients. It is an aggressive, granulomatous, and opportunistic infection by several members of the fungi. Many forms of mucormycosis are there. Rhino cerebral orbital mucormycosis is the most common of which. And the most important uh, risk factor uh, to highlight is uncontrolled diabetes mellitus with or without ketoacidosis. 80 to 90 percent of the cases are there and treatment with the immunosuppressive disease, drugs. This is the one which paved the way for the increase in the surge of the incidence in post-COVID patients, corticosteroids and antineoplastics. The other risk factors are listed out. The most common causative organ, organism which causes the mucormycosis is the rhizopus species. It's around 70% and rest around mucor and rhizomucor. The unique feature of the pathogenesis of uh, mucormycosis is it invades the major blood vessels with consequent ischemia, necrosis, and infarction of the contagious tissues. Ketosis, hyperglycemia, and hypoxia are excellent growth condition for these fungi. So how it present? So it presents with a severe facial pain, and if it involves the orbit, it has a eye swelling and a visual disturbance. Necrotic lesions on the hot palate, which is one of the characteristic feature of this disease. And in the ENT symptoms, Nasal congestion, black scar, and infraorbital paresthesia. The moment when you put the scope, sometimes they won't feel anything. That is a characteristic feature of this disease. And epistaxis and system, uh, systemic symptoms like fevers. So how it progress? It progresses in three ways, three stages. That is the nasal mucosa and orbital involvement through the orbital apex and cerebral involvement through the artery, ophthalmic artery, superior orbital fissure, or through the dura from the tributary plate. So the tissue biopsy is the stands as a gold standard technique as the tissue swabs are unreliable. And the direct microscopy plays a key role in diagnosing the mucormycosis when compared to the culture and the molecular analysis. So this is a microscopic picture of a invasive fungus that is a mucormycosis where a non-septate hyphae with a right angle branching will be seen when compared to the non-invasive fungus, that is aspergillosis, where it will be septate type with acute angle branch. So to diagnose it through imaging, both CT and MRI plays a good role. It uh, helps to detect the fungal angioemission, bone destruction and necrosis, soft tissue involvement and intracranial involvement. MRI scores better than the CT in the case of delineation of the blood vessels and intracranial extension. So the classic triad for the management of mucormycosis, antifungal therapy, surgery, particularly early surgical intervention and diabetic control. So the key is early surgical debridement plus antifungal therapy plus control of the underlying risk factor is the recommended protocol. So about the antifungal therapy, amphotericin is the drug of choice, amphotericin B. And it comes in three forms. Conventional amphotericin, which is highly nephrotoxic. So we used to uh, use it as a solution soaked in gel foam to pack the nasal <coughs> cavity and to and the other rest, rest of the one are less nephrotoxic. That is amphotericin B lipid formulation and another one is liposomal amphotericin. So this, uh, these are all less nephrotoxic and they can be used in a significantly higher doses for a longer period of time. So usual dosage is 3 to 5 milligram per kg body weight per day. And the total accumulative dose is 3 grams can be administered in a space of 20 to 30 days. The key, the main part in the difficulty is the cost. The lipid complex is relatively okay, around 1,700 for 50 milligram vial, whereas liposomal, it's around 4,000 per 50 milligram. So roughly the patient may require around 250 mg per
per day. So think about the cost around twelve thousand, and for uh, importers alone, they may need to spend around three lakhs. So which is quite heavy. And the other forms are all that is overall postal control, which is usually for, for used as a prophylactic drug, three hundred milligram once daily for three months. So to, prognosis of this disease is generally poor but variable. Even in this modern era, the all-cause mortality rate is still high. That is fifty-four percent. So with this short overview. i'm just presenting a case series what we encountered in the kaveri hospital during this covid times the uh, two uh, three forms we had encountered and in that the nasal mucormycosis two cases were there and both of them are post covid with diabetes and one among them is a post renal transplant too so the the procedure what we did is a endoscopic debridement using denkers approach which is a form where we can, we do a endoscopic maxillectomy so that way we can give a good clearance and both of them are doing well and they are still in follow the next one is a rhino mucormycosis with palatal involvement so here all the patients are post covid with uncontrolled diabetes the approach is mid facial degloving approach and the endoscopic sinus debridement of the sinus diseases all the patients are doing well and uh, are all follow up to the Other patient who is around 45 year old male who had presented was in active COVID. That is a difficult part and with a DKA and with CKD, and he had a active fungal mucos fungal mu mucal mycosis too. So considering his age and he was feeling better in the initial stage without maintaining without O2 in the first five days of the COVID. So what we thought, okay, let's. Uh, Give a try. So we did a endoscopic Denkers approach with orbital excentration. Thanks to Dr. Ganesh Kumar, uh, oculoplastic surgeon, for helping out in the orbital excentration. And uh, patient did well initially, but later he succumbed to the uh, the COVID, and uh, finally we lost him on the tenth POD. So. Uh, few case case reports about the nasal mucormycosis here is a ct picture which is characteristic showing a regular sinus uh, disease where it involves more on the left side and the clinching diagnosis can be obtained only with the nasal endoscopy for this patient the nasal endoscopy finding was typical black xcar with infraorbital paresthesia that clinches the diagnosis and with that finding we took up for the denkers endoscopic denkers approach and this is a one month post op of the same patient where we can see that this is a nasal endoscopy done in the opd and we can see the now the endoscopic picture showing the well healthy epithelialized maxillary sinus and on progressing forward we can see the sphenoid ostium which is healthy and uh, and this is a sphenopalatine region so this is a one month post op of the endoscopic Denkers approach patient, and this approach is very useful where we make all the sinus cavity into a single one. Thereby, we can visualize to rule out any recurrence or residual disease in the follow. And after this, after this, the regularly we used to pack with the conventional amphotericin in a soaked in gel form, which helps to prevent the recurrence. So the other one is nasal mucormycosis with the palatal involvement. You, as you can see here, the full sinus is involved with the palatal involvement. And we did a mid-facial degloving approach. And here the incision starts from one sub uh, sublabial incision starts from one side of the maxillary tuberosity to the other side, and then old flap is elevated and then removed the disease. Here uh, the max palatal part or oh, both the side it has been involved and dental part also involved so i thank dr balaji oral maxillofacial surgeon for helping out in the dental part and he is taking care of the prosthetic uh, rehabilitation too now and the uh, uh, full clearance of the disease has been given and the palatal flap was luckily healthy for him so we could preserve it and this is the two months follow up where you can see the healthy palatal mucosa with the good edges and this is the endoscopic video of the same patient so we can see the uh, well epithelialized ethmoid region with this intact skull base and the maxillary antrum and the floor of the nasal cavity 
with the palatal surface. And orally, we can see the healthy palatal mucosa. It's a good oral agent. So that's about the muca mucus. So early surgical intervention with the antifungal therapy and the diabetic control gives a key in controlling this dreadly disease. And moving on to the next airway surgeries, that is a laryngeal airway surgeries. Here, this is about the case history of a 70 year old gentleman who had presented with the breathing difficulty for 10 days duration, aggravated for the past two days with a noisy breathing. He had a voice change for six months. But the fear of pandemic had made him to stay at home and he could not visit the hospital and uh, that made him to present late to the uh, ENT department. So he is not a smoker. On examination, he had an inspiratory strider. On endolaryngoscopy, revealed a lesion in the glottic space with inadequate glottic airway. Considering his inadequate glottic airway, we had to go for a tracheostomy and local anesthesia. Just think about the situation in COVID times. We need to do a tracheostomy and the local anesthesia with gearing up with all the PPEs and face masks. I had to do this case and then followed by video laryngoscopic excision of the lesion and the GA are done in the same city. So this is a video of the patient and this to orient ourselves, this is a video laryngoscopic picture and the uh, surgeon sits in the head end of the uh, patient and the video laryngoscopy is in position. And what we are seeing is the left false cord here, right false cord here, and the partly the true vocal cord is seen here, and the lesion is found to be attached to the anterior part of the left vocal cord, and it is firm in consistency. So after uh, after the severing the attachment of the left vocal cord, and the disease made free, and the lesion excised in toto, as you can see here. So it is delivered in toto, and the, we can make out the left vocal cord and the right true cord with an intact glottic space. And the one, what we see here is nothing but a tracheal bulb of the individual. And this is the excised lesion, which, is, which was around four into two centimeter, and the attachment part was here to the left vocal cord. And uh, the HPE with immunohistochemistry revealed as an inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor, which is a rare tumor uh, in the larynx particularly, and it's a benign tumor. Complete excision is the mainstay of treatment for this case, which we had given. And tracheostomy decanalation was done on the fourth POD, and he was discharged on fifth POD. So this is a two months post of endolaryngoscopic video, and this is a done with the help of an angle telescope to orient ourselves. This will be the larynx will be upside down. And this is epiglottis, what we see here. And uh, and this is the arytenoids and this is the vocal cord. And you can see the intact vocal cord with the intact mobility. And the glottic space is adequate to maintain the airway. <coughs> So moving on to the next case, this is a 75 year old gentleman present with a blood stain sputum on and off for one month duration. Had voice change for two months. Not a smoker, endolaryngoscopic revealed a hemangiomatous lesion in the laryngeal surface of the epiglottis arising from the lateral pharyngeal wall. Glottic airway is just adequate. So this is a pre op endolaryngoscopic picture. So where you can see the epiglottis, again, this is the and this is the lesion which was sitting over the laryngeal surface of the epiglottis and found arising from the lateral pharyngeal wall. And this is the glottic space. So this lesion was sitting just over the glottis and uh, that is a real challenge to manage. So considering the age and the patient also had a poor pulmonary reserve, 75 years old with a poor pulmonary reserve and the lesion, site of the lesion, tracheostomy was done under the LA and followed by video laryngoscopy extrusion of the lesion under the G in the same sitting done. So HP with immunohistochemistry revealed a, as a, another rare tumor, that's a neuroendocrine tumor with a paraganglioma type, so which is a benign one, 
and patient is doing well now. Tracheostomy decannulation done on the fourth POD. He was discharged on the fifth POD. So moving on to the other airway surgeries, that is bronchial airway surgeries, which is significantly at a high aerosol generating procedures. And here the thing is we can intubate the child also. And uh, the we need to introduce a, a rigid bronchoscope and the whole uh, theater set up and the anesthetist, surgeon and the OT staffs, everybody has to be exposed to the eye aerosol generating uh, procedure. Here, another uh, tough situation is the patient will be presenting to us in an emergency way. So we can do only the CT as an emergency and uh, we can't wait for the RT-PCR to come. So we, with the help, of, with the CT finding and the, with the uh, CT report, we took up the cases, which we'll be discussing now. So Mac, about a brief intro about the foreign body bronchus. Maximum incidence of foreign body aspiration occurs in the six months to three years. And the types of foreign bodies are organic and metal. Right main bronchus is the most common site for foreign body, being it's uh, larger in diameter and uh, uh, straight in axis with the trachea. The classic triad in uh, the way which they present is the cough, unilateral V's and the diminished pressure Most common, this is seen in the organic foreign bodies. So this is a tool which is useful uh, to remove the foreign bodies, the rigid bronchoscope with the optical forceps or regular forceps used to remove the foreign bodies from the bronchus. Some few interesting cases which I had encountered during this time. This is a one-year-old child present with a foreign body inhalation and the parents had a, had a typical history of witnessed uh, choking event. And otherwise, clinically, child is stable, diminished air entering the right side person. Otherwise, child was doing well. And uh, this is the X-ray, which tells us a huge foreign body sitting over the uh, right main bronchus. And that tells about that. And uh, so, so pre-removal pre endoscopic video. This is a novel technique where we introduce a laryngoscope. And uh, with the adult nasal endoscope, I try to visualize the foreign body location. So I'm just trying to in introduce through the vocal cord. Once if I bypass the vocal cord, I'm just entering the trachea. On progressing further, I could see a, I could see a metal foreign body in the level of the carina. So with this finding, just a rigid bronchoscope is introduced and placed. And during that time, the anesthetist will be ventilating through the rigid bronchoscope. And the optical forceps is introduced and placed in portion and then used to visualize the foreign body. And the foreign body is tried to withdrawn. Since it's a huge foreign body, this has to be taken along with the scope and it is slowly withdrawn, as you can see, and then removed in total. So in the case of metal foreign body, this is quite easy, whereas in the vegetable foreign body, it's quite difficult with the, it won't come in a single sitting. One sec. So this is a removed foreign body, as you can see, and this, is a, this was there in the X-ray. And moving on to the second case, this is a two-year-old girl, history of foreign body inhalation with, a, again, the witness choking event, clinically child stable, air entry was also equal on both sides, and this is the x-ray. And you can see there, uh, there is a radiopic foreign body present in the right main bronchus, the two sharp ends facing us. And this is a bronchoscopic view of the same child, that is, you can see a two prominent sharp spikes are seen and uh, care should be taken while removing this because the both the sharp portion should come into the rigid bronchoscope and then remove in total if if in case if we remove one one side it may go and injure the trachea which is the two for a two-year-old kid that will be a catastrophic and this is a foreign body removal that was a led bulb foreign body and uh, care was taken to remove both in in total so 
this is a three year old boy person with a history of fever and cough for past five days and foreign body inhalation curry for, for five days back and they were not very sure the parents were not very sure and then clinically the child was tachypneic and febrile diminished air entry was present in the left side and this is the x ray so this is nothing but hyper inflated left lung with a mediational shift towards the opposite side that is to the right side so this happens in the foreign bodies with the short history we can come to a conclusion that is this is a check valve mechanism that is a foreign body gets embedded into the trachea the bronchus and then it allows only the inhalation and not the exhalation of the air so the air is trapped in the lungs and thereby it is presenting as a obstructive emphysema so ct finding which also tells the same finding the air the scout film gives a clear picture and this is the foreign body beetle net foreign body removed from the left main bronchus and this picture says everything drastic change in the reversal of all the findings where the trachea and the mediastinum everything got shifted with a normal appearing lung my sincere thanks to the anesthesia team led by dr k sendil kumar it is with their support and coordination only i could present this case series otherwise it would have been very difficult and thank thanks to dr chokling him sir management and the organizing team for giving me this opportunity to present this series thank you thank you thank you very much dr hari mayapan uh, for the excellent yes. overview of the uh, ent procedures uh, you had to carry during this uh, scary covid times uh, please stay with us for questions at the end uh, okay. and i'm just going to request the next speaker i think it's going to be uh, uh, dr kulasekar i think it's a cardiac times covid surgery uh, um, in cardiac uh, department um, i think it's one of the high risk uh, departments as it is uh, but to operate during covid times uh, they really had to uh, face the challenge let's see how they faced it and over to dr kulasekar thank you kottingla uh, hello yeah Good evening. You're audible, Dr. Kulasekaran. You're audible. Yeah, You're sure. audible. Please. Yeah. Proceed. Good evening. So I am uh, Dr. Kulasekaran, cardiothoracic surgeon at Kaveri Heart City, Trichy. It's real pleasure to be part of this uh, webinar series. So it's more than nine months since the epidemic has started in our country, and it has not only changed the way we live, but has also changed the way medicine is practiced across various specialties. so in my presentation i'll share our experience in cardiac surgery during epidemic time so my talk is mainly focused on these four areas first how epidemic influenced cardiac surgery work in our unit and second how we are managing cardiac surgery patients during epidemic time and next how patients with covid infections are managed and last few lessons we have learned during the course of this epidemic so this bar chart shows how work trend during the covid year 2020 so in pre covid times on an average we were doing around 50 to 60 major heart surgeries and around 10 minor procedures a month so it is clear from the graph that from our normal average we saw a severe drop in the month of april and may recovered to 75% during june and july followed by another second drop between august to november month and now we are finally recovering back to the normal in december so the covid lockdown was announced in the third week of march and the initial drop was due to government restrictions on doing elective surgeries and travel restrictions for patients so we were doing only essential life saving procedures during that time so we started doing elective surgeries from june and the numbers increased so august to november the second drop was the peak infection time observed at our unit so more patients who were admitted for elective surgeries uh, were found to be positive on screening and surgeries were postponed for them so we started operating on this post covid patients from the month of september so these are the patients who had infection in earlier month who have managed conservatively and had their surgery postponed so i am happy to say that after 8 months of fluctuations we have now recovered and we are back to our normal work numbers from this month and expect a good start in next year 
So with second and third waves of COVID recurrence happening in many countries and a few parts of our country, we should stay prepared to face the worst if it happens again. So during our initial crisis time, uh, our unit manpower was split into two, which each team working for one week and staying on self-isolation for next week. The rationale being if even one team member gets an infection, the other team can take over and the function can continue without any interruption. Uh, and all the patients were categorized into priority groups based on uh, disease severity and symptoms. And the preference were given only to more critical patients and stable patients were managed conservatively. So in our current practice, whether it is pre-COVID or post-COVID, the cardiac surgery management remains the same. Uh, so discussing individual case is not relevant, but except few situations, except uh, we know all patients are screened for uh, active COVID infection. And the timing of surgery is mainly depends on the COVID status of the patient. And the using PPE has become the normal. So these changes are made into a practice based on the fact that uh, there's around 60% of asymptomatic infection in the community. And if a patient has active COVID infection, more than 30% mortality is reported if they have elective surgery and the whole healthcare team protection. So this is our current protocol followed at Kaveri Heart City for screening patients who are coming for elective surgery. On the day of admission, the patient gets a HRCT scan chest done and one RT-PCR test. If both are negative, then patient is shifted from the screening ward to a regular ward. And the 48 hours after the first RT-PCR, they get a second RT-PCR test done. If that is also negative, is taken up for surgery. So only one attender is permitted to stay with the patient and that attender is also screened for RT-PCR on the day of admission. So during the entire hospital stay, patient and attender are assessed for COVID symptoms daily. So this is the sample screening assessment form where the upper half shows all the symptoms documented and the nurse every day uh, questions the patient and documents them. And the lower half shows the HRCT scan and the RT-PCR dates. And the last row shows the specialist opinion attending to the patient. So now cardiac surgery in patients who had COVID. So each patient with a history of COVID infection is assessed by a team of specialists, mainly a cardiologist, cardiac surgeon, anesthetist, ID specialist, and pulmonologist and radiologist. The main purpose of patient assessment is to know whether he has a COVID infection or not, or are there any post-COVID complications and overall fitness to undergo surgery. So the initial assessment contains uh, one HRCT scan chest, one RT-PCR, and the COVID antibody test, mainly immunoglobin gene, and the inflammatory markers are done. If patient has COVID pneumonia, a six minute walk test and a rumor saturation is documented. Every effort is made to identify the time of initial infection. So we know the duration of infection. So based on the assessment, patient belongs to one of these five groups. So this protocol is proposed by Dr. Dominic Sir, and we are following that now. In the five groups, the safest patient to operate are patient who had COVID infection, whose COVID antibody is positive, inflammatory markers are normal, RT-PCR and HRCT is normal, and uh, the COVID infection was beyond three weeks time. And the second group we see is patient who have RT-PCR negative, but HRCT shows indeterminate COVID, but they have COVID antibody positive and markers are normal. Again, these patients we take with a little high risk. But uh, excuse me. Yeah. And the highest risk patient is patient who have a HRCT scan positive and who have the inflammatory markers elevated. So these patients usually we postpone the surgery till the patient recovers completely. 
So this is the sample assessment form. The upper half shows the uh, history uh, of the previous COVID infection documentation and the lower of the current assessment of the COVID status. And the back of the form has all the specialist opinion taken and the plan is documented at the end. So for patients who have an active, active COVID infection who needs cardiac surgery, if it's an elective cardiac surgery in a stable patient, surgery is postponed till complete recovery. For urgent and emergency surgeries, optimal perioperative approach is still controversial. The high risk of mortality is reported. All other less invasive alternatives are considered if he has an active infection. So emergency high-risk surgery can be undertaken for life-saving purposes as long as adequate PP is available and the patient's critical illness is not due to COVID-19. So in an emergency situation when full COVID screening is not possible, the risk benefit has to be carefully assessed. The risk of the team getting exposed to a possible COVID source and the risk of patient dying from COVID infection, risk of patient dying from natural history of the disease, and the risk of patient having surgery with active COVID infection are very carefully assessed and the decision is taken. So in general, if patient has a COVID pneumonia, the surgery is delayed for two weeks and patient is assessed after two weeks. And if patient with COVID pneumonia, surgery is scheduled after four weeks time. So there are a few lessons we have learned during the epidemic time. So the, the first one is, uh, this is a patient, Mr. B, 53 year old male patient, uh, who was screened for COVID infection, found to be negative, and he underwent elective CAVG. On the first post-op day, he was having persistent fever spikes above 100 degrees. It's very unlikely for an infection at that stage. Still, uh, we sent all the cultures and uh, started him on broad spectrum antibiotics, but it was not responding. So when cultures came negative on third post-op day, we sent the RT-PCR, which came positive. So despite all the screening protocol, this patient, uh, COVID diagnosis was missed. So the message is this, no screening is 100% and all patients should be considered as low risk and not a no risk. So initially, in the earlier stage, we were doing one RT-PCR and one HRCT scan for screening the patient. After this incident, we added a second RT-PCR test to the protocol. And the next, next scene is uh, where patients uh, have two, one or two RT-PCRs which come negative, but the HRCT shows indeterminate COVID, which is not strongly positive or not negative in the in-between and patient has no COVID symptoms. So these patients in the early time, we were postponing for four weeks and then taking, but later on when COVID antibody testing became available, we started testing them and we were able to differentiate between patients who had actual COVID infection and patients uh, who had uh, radiological signs for other reasons. So after this, uh, we now do both COVID antibody testing and inflammatory markers are done for whenever HRCT scan shows indeterminate positivity. And the third one is patient having a new COVID infection after the surgery. A 47 year old man underwent a mitral valve replacement and he had an uneventful hospital course. So he was discharged on day seven. After seven days, he came back to casualty and he was admitted with uh, take. He was uh, unwell and uh, Certainly, the yeah. COVID. Hello. Yeah. Uh, and this COVID test was. So this patient was referred to a COVID care center where he had a very strong post confidential So patients after cardiac surgery are more vulnerable for getting COVID infection or if they have a COVID infection, they are a very morbid So Infection during recovery period has to be avoided. 
So now we Manu do Manu. a very thorough okay, patient okay, and okay, family Manu. education Manu. about Manu. how to Thank protect you. the patient from uh, COVID infection. And every attender or close contact with the patient is also advised COVID screening. So these are the four stages of a doctor who take care of a patient uh, in COVID times. So that's the savior, survivor, warrior, and victim. So we all are proud to call ourselves savior during COVID. Few of us have survived COVID infection, but unfortunately, few doctors have fought the infection and succumbed to it becoming victim. So more than 600 doctors have died from COVID so far. The quote on the right is taken from the famous textbook of uh, social and preventive medicine by Dr. Park. The first chapter starts uh, with a quote, those who fail to learn from history are destined to suffer the reputation of its mistake. So the lockdown, though lockdown is over, epidemic is not over yet. So we have to protect ourselves. So that brings us to the new normal lifestyle. So when I went through the list of uh, IMA, uh, one striking thing was most of the doctors died during epidemic where general practitioners, we who got this uh, infection during their outpatient consultation time where they get exposed to a lot of strangers in a closed space. So this picture shows uh, my OP room setup. I would like to uh, spend some time explaining how it is. The first, the patient enters the room with a mask and he's seated six feet away from me. So that's a social distancing day. The second level of protection is the transparent partition kept between me and the patient. So what are the aerosol switches generated from my infected source are blocked by that. And the third one is there's an air filter with a true HIPAA filter placed between me and the patient. So whatever aerosols which escapes the partition, it is actively sucked by this air purifier and the air around me is always filtered. And last, I use face shield with an N95 mask. This whole setup costs less than 12,000 and it greatly reduces the risk of exposure in the OP setting. So this is another view of OP setting where the partition air filter uh, position is shown. So adding these two things can uh, make a change. So in the initial days, we were doing teleconsultation. Now uh, we are not using it much. So ward rounds is done with the face shield with the N95 mask whenever we are consulting a high risk or a suspected patient. It helps to reduce the exposure. So most of the surgeries are done with only a N95 mask as we still consider surgery as a low risk exposure and not no risk exposure. For patients uh, with uh, high risk exposure or suspected COVID patients, when we have to the emergencies, I still prefer to wear a P100 respirator. So I am happy to say that uh, at Kaveri uh, Heart City, one day in every week is reserved for operating on patients who had COVID infection earlier. So mostly it is Saturdays. So finally, I thank the organizers and my chief doctor T. Sendil Kumar for giving me this opportunity to share my views. I wish you all a good health. God bless and thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Klusegra, for, for the excellent overview of cardiac services during COVID times. Uh, cardiac surgery is a high risk, uh, high risk specialty as it is, and to take patients and operate on them during this uh, uh, difficult time, pandemic, uh, hats off to you and the team, and to Dr. TSK sir and his uh, excellent uh, leadership. Now we will move on to the next talk. Uh, without further delay, a request to Dr. Anis, uh, who has been giving an excellent uh, service on the cancer care. This is one uh, specialty which uh, scares not only the uh, patient and the relatives because of their underlying condition, but also the access to uh, services during this COVID times had to be kept uh, in a very good way uh, to maintain uh, their support system. Uh, hats off to Dr. Anis and the team and uh, over to Dr. Anis to present your, uh, your uh, experience during this time. Thank you. Uh, I'm Dr. Anis. I'm a surgical oncologist uh, from uh, Kaveri Cancer Center and uh, Kaveri Hospital. 
Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to take part in this uh, CME on uh, surgery during uh, COVID times. Uh, my sincere thanks to Powery Hospital for organizing this program and uh, giving me this opportunity. So I'll be speaking on how we manage to continue cancer care uh, amidst this uh, COVID scam. It all started in the last few weeks of uh, December, and this journal is one of the first paper published by Chinese Medical Journal. And the five patients admitted in a hospital in Wuhan and later diagnosed with uh, fatal pneumonia caused by uh, COVID-19 infection. And uh, subsequently, in another uh, two weeks, this was published in uh, uh, Lancet. It was the first uh, a paper which confirmed that this virus can spread from uh, person to person. And we all know that on March 11th of uh, 11th of March, WHO declared this outbreak as a, a pandemic and uh, uh, it declared it as a uh, global health emergency. And uh, followed which our uh, Indian government implemented a, a nationwide uh, lockdown. The spread of the disease happened so quickly that in the early weeks of April, when we were about to face this virus, we had very little uh, uh, knowledge about this virus. And that little knowledge was also from the experience of the Western uh, world. And we had this fear of uh, facing this unknown virus due to various unanswered questions and uh, speculation. We knew that many of these patients uh, infected uh, with the virus are going to be asymptomatic, but we didn't know at that point of time how to identify them and how to uh, isolate them. And uh, personal protective equipment, the PPE term was very new to us. And we did not know exactly how to protect healthcare team and, uh, from the infected uh, patient. And there are a lot of scientific data on aerosol generation of uh, viral particles and spread during intubation and uh, intraoperative uh, use of uh, energy sources and uh, during laparoscopic uh, surgeries. And uh, these uh, scientific data and speculations, uh, uh, we were not very sure how to tackle them. And uh, most importantly, at that point of time, we didn't have the uh, testing facility, that's the gold standard testing, uh, RT-PCR. Uh, although we had a CT scan at that point of time, which later proved to be a very, very sensitive uh, investigation to diagnose uh, COVID-19. Because of these unanswered questions, we had to suspend all our activities for a very brief, brief period of time. But there are uh, specific challenges uh, of cancer management, such as uh, ethically, is it right to ask a patient to wait for some time when he has been diagnosed with cancer? And uh, if at all the patient agrees to wait, and how long to wait? Because we knew this pandemic was not going to be uh, going to be there for a, a while. And uh, will the wait uh, affect the overall outcome of the survival? And uh, what about patients undergoing chemotherapy? What to do with them? And what about patients undergoing radiation therapy? These were running through our minds. And uh, fortunately, we have uh, uh, access to a lot of uh, uh, knowledge through the internet. And this was one of the uh, very good uh, paper published by Annals of Surgery, where they had tried to analyze the uh, delay in cancer treatment with the uh, overall outcome. And they, and they showed that aggressive cancers like gallbladder cancers, ovarian cancers, urinary tract cancers, kidney cancers, and testicular cancers, you cannot wait even for a week because they, they were very aggressive cancers. And cancers like colonic cancers and retroperitoneal tumors, again, you cannot wait for more than one or two weeks. Whereas the common cancers we commonly encounter, like the, the breast cancers or uh, the cancer cervix or the uterine cancers or the uh, three cancers, they have data for three to four weeks uncertainty. And after a thorough uh, discussion with our fellow uh, oncologists within the institute and outside the institute, we finally decided to suspend all uh, screening programs for the moment. We decided uh, uh, to skip the follow-up follow patients or those patients who have completed the treatment and follow-up every three months. We uh, requested them to uh, not visit and skip one visit and uh, visit us after three, four months. And uh, we encouraged teleconsultation of all those uh, follow-up patients Newly diagnosed cancer patients were uh, counseled to wait for uh, three, four weeks and they were reassured that uh, oh, the overall uh, outcome will not be affected much by this uh, delay. And patients on chemotherapy were delayed uh, the next cycle by two to three weeks. And uh, patients on radiation therapy alone had to be uh, continued on treatment. <clears throat> and by this time, we, we gained a lot of knowledge. We moved into the next month of uh, May. And uh, there are a lot of uh, good... Uh, uh, research papers uh, uh, like uh, one from the American College of uh, uh, American College of Surgeons, and uh, which uh, uh, which guided us from guided us to how to protect ourselves uh, before surgery, intraoperatively, and post surgery, 
and th this was one very good paper uh, published by the oncology group uh, from aims new delhi and they they gave overall guidelines to how to manage cancer patients during this uh, epidemic and this was published in may 6 and their uh, their emphasis was uh, surgical procedures to be chosen with the intent of better survival as per the stage of the disease that is patient who has the highest chance of survival should be offered surgery uh, whereas the emergency surgery should be offered for all patients like uh, tracheostomy for a uh, laryngeal cancer or hypopharyngeal cancer with a strider uh, colorectal cancer uh, causing intestinal obstruction or an oral cavity cancer that is bleeding and hemothorax or pleural effusion in a metastatic uh, lung cancer and all terminal cancer patients must be must be optimized and uh, as much as possible palliative treatment should be done and uh, priority for surgery should be uh, given for patients had the very high chance of and uh, avoid avoid extensive surgeries like uh, microvascular reconstruction and the prolonged laparoscopic uh, surgeries uh, breast reconstruction and the esophageal surgeries were uh, advised to be delayed for some time and uh, surgery should be avoided in a very high risk uh, patients who have the uh, high chance of uh, being admitted in the ic so we had to change our uh, protocol uh, uh, modify our protocol uh, a bit and uh, most patients uh, with breast cancers the early breast cancers would be offered uh, surgery upfront surgery as at that point of time neogen hormonal therapy neogen chemotherapy were offered for all breast cancer patient including early breast cancer patient and surgery was offered for only high risk uh, breast cancer and very early cancers were operated and uh, metastatic tumors we uh, receive palliative chemotherapy in that case uh, we offered them hormonal therapy were possible and the palliative radiation therapy was uh, mostly deferred in head and neck cancers again uh, radical radiation therapy was uh, offered whenever uh, feasible for uh, early stage advanced cancer and surgery was offered only for uh, thyroid and parotid cancers where uh, uh, radiation uh, is not feasible and early oral cancers again Uh, uh again uh, uh, it was offered only when uh, radiation cannot be uh, given and all the and uh, hypopharyngeal cancers were offered the uh, neogen chemotherapy or radical uh, radiation in gynecological cancer surgery was offered for uh, uh, suspected ovarian mass and endometrial cancers uh, whereas uh, radiation therapy was uh, offered for all uh, cervix cancers and the pre malignant lesions like uh, cervical intraepithelial neoplasia uh, patients were deferred uh, uh, treatment or delayed for 4 uh, to 5 weeks and uh, all advanced ovarian cancers were offered uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy and the uh, gastrointestinal hepatobiliary cancers again esophageal cancers and stomach cancers received uh, neoadjuvant uh, therapy stomach cancers still neoadjuvant chemotherapy and uh, esophageal cancers neoadjuvant chemotherapy or neoadjuvant chemo radiation therapy based on the location and histological type and all patients uh, with the gastric outlet obstruction or severe dysphagia underwent either stenting if possible or uh, right tube insertion followed by uh, neoadjuvant therapy all rectal cancers uh, were uh, offered uh, neoadjuvant chemo radiation therapy only colon cancers were uh, offered uh, upfront surgery and pancreatic or biliary cancers uh, with uh, obstructive jaundice were offered uh, stenting followed by surgery after uh, four weeks and uh, later when we moved on uh, to the next phase of uh, june uh, the testing facility was available and uh, we were uh, more efficient in triaging patients our uh, knowledge about this virus and uh, how to protect ourselves uh, uh, became better and personal protective measures became a routine practice and uh, we realized that the sensitivity and specificity for diagnosing covid-19 was very high when clinical history was pt test and rt pcr so since june we have uh, started the offering optimal uh, cancer care as in uh, non covid time and uh, we have uh, uh, we have done almost 212 uh, uh, cancer procedures and out of uh, that more than 42% are uh, major procedures and head and neck cancers uh, most commonly uh, perform procedures are minor oral resection for oral cavity cancers like tongue cancers and uh, buccal mucosa cancer and uh, thyroidectomies uh, either Uh, with uh, neck node dissection for malignant uh, lesions or uh, uh, simple total thyroidectomy for uh, suspicious nodules uh, we have done a few uh, composite resections for advanced oral uh, cancer uh, cancers uh, where uh, the tumor end block with the hem hem hemi mandible and the neck nodal uh, dissection has been done and uh, plastic uh, reconstruction surgery has been uh, offered we have done a couple of uh, 
uh, radical parotid ectomies we have uh, performed a couple of uh, total laryngectomy and one uh, case with total laryngectomy with the partial laryngectomy and uh, uh, pmmc uh, flap reconstruction we had done one uh, laryngo pharyngo esophagectomy for uh, residual uh, uh, cancer type of pharynx after uh, radical chemo radiation therapy and in breast and gynecology the most common uh, procedure uh, performed was the uh, modified radical mastectomy for uh, breast cancer uh, breast conservation surgery rates are very low in our part of the country basically because of the low less incidence of early breast cancer as well as uh, uh, low acceptance rate of this procedure in our part of the country and we have performed a radical hysterectomy and laparoscopic hysterectomy for uh, carcinoma cervix and the carcinoma endometrium and we have performed a few benign hysterectomies for uh, complex uh, benign lesions such as large uh, cervical fibroids large uh, broad pigment fibroids and uh, diffuse extensive endometriosis in the hepat- in the he- gastrointestinal hepatobiliary oncology we have uh, performed a couple of batch assisted uh, mechon uh, esophagectomies and the radical gastrectomy is for uh, distal and uh, proximal uh, stomach cancers uh, we have uh, performed a uh, uh, pulse uh, procedure for uh, head of pancreas cancer and uh, we have quite a number of uh, uh, colorectal cancers for uh, colorectal resections for colonic and uh, rectal cancers which includes uh, hartman's procedures and we have uh, we performed few uh, costume closures and during uh, diagnostics <clears throat> and uh, other cancers that include a chest wall resections uh, were done two cases one for chondrosarcoma of the second and third uh, another one for hemangioma of the uh, sixth and seventh rib and uh, we had one large solitary fibrous tumor of the left lung uh, removed by open laparotomy and uh, we had a couple of uh, vats done for uh, one for a uh, carcinoma uh, thyroid with uh, mediastinal nodes for which a vat mediastinal node resection was done and uh, we had done one radical cystoprostatectomy for a really gentleman with a muscle invasive uh, urinary bladder cancer uh, we had a couple of uh, uh, partial penile amputations and one radical nephrectomy for uh, uh, renal cell carcinoma uh, we had one large retroperitoneal mass excise uh, for a patient with an extra uh, adrenal pheochromocytoma after appropriate uh, preoperative uh, optimization of the patient and a couple of uh, soft tissue sarcoma resections that These are some of the interesting uh, uh, procedures uh, that were done in the recent past. This uh, recurrent uh, phyllites, uh, large phyllites uh, weighing around uh, 3 kg uh, with an extensive uh, skin involvement. This is a, a radical compartmental excision for a uh, cast uh, tongue uh, where uh, the, uh, the approach is through the midline uh, uh, mandible split. Uh, the entire tongue is uh, uh, pulled into the neck. Uh, the origin of the extrinsic muscle from the hyoid is divided the mylohyoid is divided from the uh, mandible and the entire half of the uh, tongue with the extrinsic muscle is uh, removed in block with the uh, neck nodes <clears throat> and uh, the resection was done by uh, our uh, we are very fortunate to have one plastic team led by dr skanda uh, we had an uh, fcap free flap and this was a left lung uh, a large solitary fibrous tumor uh, which was weighing around uh, 1.5 kg and this is a whipple's uh, procedure uh, specimen and this uh, posterior pelvic excentration then for a uh, locally advanced uh, ovarian cancer you can see the uterus uh, removed end block the uh, mid and the lower rectum uh, you can see the pod peritoneum in the uterus and the uh, rectum uh, involved by extensive uh, uh, nodular disease and the anterior to the uterus you can see the Uh, end block uh, bladder peritoneum with the disease that was uh, uh, removed uh, this is a superficial parotidectomy uh, picture showing the uh, origin of uh, facial nerve is developed and the five branches so our message is uh, complex cancer surgeries can be performed uh, safely even in covid time with good outcome after appropriate triaging and uh, proper uh, personal uh, safety measure and uh, thanks again uh, uh, for the I mean, for giving me this opportunity uh, thanks thank you uh, very much dr anis uh, so the overview of the uh, spread of cancer surgeries you have performed uh, with the excellent team uh, and support from the hospital uh, we will uh, have a question for you at the end uh, and uh, we're going to request dr satyadev Uh, he, uh to come to a hospital during covid times uh, is stressful as it is for us as adults but to bring your child to surgery uh, can be even more daunting let's see how dr satyadev and his team uh, delivered the pediatric surgery services during this uh, difficult time how to dr satyadev
Dr. Satyadeva, are you, are you online? Dilip, can you put Dr. Satyadeva online? Dilip, can you hear me? Uh, doctor okay. I think uh, uh, if we are going to wait for him to join, let's uh, have some questions for the faculty. I think we'll start off with uh, Dr. Ramasamy. Um, Hello. Uh, is that Satyadeva online? Hello. Am I audible, sir? Yes, you are now, Dr. Satyadeva. Please proceed. The, the, the podium is yours. Hello. We can hear you, doctor. We can hear you, doctor. I'm not able to share the screen. Dilip, make Dr. Satyadev co-host, please. You should be able to do it now, Dr. Satyadev. Yes, sir. Let's let, let start up your uh, slide show, sir. F5, F5 or... Uh, yes, sir, right, right. Uh, okay. Thank sir, you. am I audible, sir? Yes, sir, yes, sir. So, uh, good evening, everybody. Um, at the fag end of this uh, brainstorming session, I am uh, indeed uh, thankful to the Kaveri management who have given me this opportunity to present uh, uh, the pediatric surgery work done in the COVID times. I am Dr. J. Satyadev, a pediatric surgeon in Kaveri Speciality Hospital. So we all know that this year, 2020, is, uh, most of the year was consumed by the pandemic, can be termed as a coronavirus year. The world was temporarily closed during the late part of uh, March till July, and uh, a lot of people suffered, especially the healthcare professionals. In my presentation, I will be elaborating the work done by the pediatric and the pediatric surgical department in our hospital. Uh, COVID in children usually presents in the asymptomatic manner or with very mild symptoms. Uh, recently, there have been a talk about uh, uh, serious medical condition, a sequelae called uh, MIS-C, which is called multi-system inflammatory syndrome, which is being occurring in uh, a few kids who, uh, who already had the COVID infection. Coming to the challenges that uh, as a pediatric surgery, surgery department we, we had during the COVID uh, season was, one was screening the patients before a uh, surgical procedure. All the patients underwent RT-PCR test and uh, CT chest during the initial period, but uh, the, the amount of uh, radiation given to children, uh, young children was uh, debatable 
and slowly over time we we stopped doing ct chest unless the patients had uh, respiratory signs the other challenge that we had encountered was counseling the parents of an asymptomatic child who had come for a surgical procedure the parents never accept the diagnosis they say my child never left the house during the lockdown and refused to accept that the the, the child was covid positive the third challenge was that the child was shifted to a covid care center and uh, during the initial period uh, the child had to be managed without the parents and i should really thank the uh, staff nurse who who gave their uh, good care and uh, kept the child cheerful during that period i'll be discussing a few interesting cases that we did during this covid period the first one was an 8 month old female child presenting with uh, bilious ms uh, with abdomen distension and red current jelly stool the patient was dehydrated and uh, was in shock at the time of presentation an x ray abdomen showed uh, signs of small bowel obstruction and an ultrasound revealed uh, ileo ideal intersusception the baby was resuscitated in our er uh, saline reduction under ultrasound guidance was attempted but it was unsuccessful the patient the patient was then taken up for lap laparotomy and uh, in the laparotomy we were not able to reduce the intersusception and so we proceeded with the resection and anastomosis because the patient was in shock Uh, we we didn't have the time to do a covid test or a ct chest screening um, and so a covid swab was taken non table which turned out to be positive the next day we then shifted the baby to a covid care center ct chest showed covid changes uh, steroids were started although steroids are found to delay the wound healing the steroids were started to treat the covid condition uh, in the baby from second post op period as she as the baby had ct chest changes post operatively the baby came out uneventfully this is the this is the picture showing uh, bowel within the bowel intersusception the second picture shows the resection and anastomosis the second case is a 6 year old child with intermittent colicky pain and bilious vomiting ultrasound was done outside to reveal the colocolic intersusception the cystic lesion a uh, cystic lesion a repeat ultrasound done in our uh, institution uh, revealed a cystic lesion in the epigastrium so there was a di- diagnostic dilemma in this case because it was a very unusual age for intersusception usually intersusception present within 3 years of age and uh, the sonographic reports were varying the patient was not having any toxic symptoms so we decided to defer the saline reduction and planned for a diagnostic laparoscopy in the meantime we did a ct abdomen with rectal contrast which confirmed uh, the presence of intersusception but to our surprise we the covid test uh, rt pcr screening turned out to be positive and the patient had to be shifted to a covid center an emergency laparotomy was done and ileo colic intersusception was identified and the intersusception was reduced by milking distally we found a zero cell lesion in the distal ileum which is seen in this picture which was thought to be a lead point for the intersusception so we decided to proceed with the resection and anastomosis the resection of distal ileum with cecum and an ileo colic anastomosis was done in the child then on uh, going through the literature it was found that there are rare occurrences of uh, children presenting with uh, intersusception as a feature in uh, covid-19 uh, infection this is a one case report uh, of a child having presented with intersusception in uh, usa this is another case 
these are all single case reports which was uh, a child presenting uh, with intersusception in a covid positive baby we treated uh, two cases successfully the next uh, interesting cases were a case of suspected covid it was an 11 year old boy who presented with abdominal pain vomiting and fever the boy was referred from a place with higher positivity rate during that period so he was directly sent to the covid care center a ct chest screening was done the, the patient was referred after 5 years of 5 uh, days after the symptoms started the cause was of the delayed referral was because there were less functioning private opds at that time and very few scan centers were functioning a sonography done in our center revealed an appendicular perforation without waiting for the rt pcr results because the patient had peritonitis features the, the patient was taken for laparotomy and appendicectomy was done in both the cases where uh, laparotomy was done laparoscopy was an option but at that time when uh, the incidence of uh, covid was very severe the society of american endoscopic surgeons had uh, suggested laparoscopy had an uh, increased potential to release viruses through the aerosol spread in the ot room and it is it, it is endangering the entire team to the risk of contracting covid but now now with our uh, availability of devices to filter the released co2 and uh, uh, we have started doing the laparoscopic surgeries now covid negative cases initial period when the covid was uh, severe and in the lockdown the elective surgeries were postponed initially then both the doctors and the patients started adapting to the new normal the patients have started accepting to the new protocols and the increased cost of the procedure due to the additional tests and uh, increased stay and uh, the need for protective measures to the healthcare professionals neonatal surgeries were also performed during the covid period now uh, most of the neonatal surgeries were uh, done without waiting for the rt pcr status just by looking at the mother's covid status i'll be showing a few neonatal surgeries uh, that were done in the covid period this is a case of a pyloric stenosis which underwent a pyloromyotomy a case of necrotizing enterocolitis with a perforation in the distal ileum the patient underwent the ileostomy uh, we also did uh, major procedures like uh, lobectomy this is a case of uh, congenital lobar emphysema uh, lobar emphysema where we did a lobectomy this is a case of uh, proximal jejunal uh, intestinal atresia the patient underwent uh, ileo uh, jejunal anastomosis this is another case of uh, pulmonary sequestration uh, the patient underwent uh, lobectomy and a few pediatric emergencies in uh, covid negative cases were done during the covid uh, period this is a meckel's diverticulum which uh, underwent uh, uh, resection of the diverticulum and uh, ileo ileal anastomosis so another case presented with uh, intestinal obstruction underwent emergency laparotomy uh, was found to have an hirschsprung disease the patient then was uh, then had an uh, diverting colostomy and followed by uh, the definitive duhamel pull through procedure i would like to thank my pediatric team under uh, dr sengutwan the anesthetic team under dr ksk and radiology team under uh, dr svm for helping me out during this uh, tough period and uh, giving good results in pediatric cases thank you thank you dr satyadev uh, for the nice uh, illustration of uh, the spectrum of pediatric cases which you had to deal with surgery and uh, hats off to the pediatric team who uh, capably supported you and uh, now um, i just want to thank all the participants uh, who have uh, made this uh, webinar a success 
and uh, a special thanks to dr marudu pandian who is representing tamil nadu medical council who is also attending this webinar um, uh, on surgery in covid times i think we have few minutes to uh, close up this session with some questions and comments uh, first uh, of uh, i would like to uh, ask um, dr ramasamy are you uh, still online dr ramasamy yeah 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 okay now uh, uh, you showed a spectrum of cases uh, which were dealt by orthopedic department uh, please uh, talk to us about the rib fractures uh, which you you shown because the rib fractures are uh, traditionally managed by conservative methods uh, and what were your indications and why did you have to operate on them during this difficult covid times uh, so obviously uh, you know the chest injury with one or two rib fractures or a common finding most of us see these type of injuries in day to day practice but severe chest injuries with pneumothorax and pneumothorax they have been traditionally managed by uh, uh, deventing or removing uh, the obstructing air or the obstructing blood in the pleural cavity and thereby allowing the lungs to expand so most of the cases in around 75% of the cases with hemothorax pneumothorax or hemopneumothorax this is sufficient there are but there are certain situations where you get bilateral chest fracture or a condition called the flail chest or uh, in other words a single rib is broken at two places and the number of rib ribs broken is generally more than 3 maybe 5 or 6 so in uh, this sort of situation the broken segment is drawn inwards that is it moves opposite to that of the rest of the chest cavity and uh, which is called the paradoxical uh, respiration or paradoxical breathing so in this the lung compliance is reduced even though the patient uh, is trying to breathe in the lung is not adequately expanding Uh, for uh, the reason that the segment which has been broken is drawn inwards and sometimes what we have seen during the fixation of the these rib fractures is that uh, the broken bits of the rib are caved into the chest cavity and this reduces the volume of the lung uh, the volume of the pleural cavity and hence the lung cannot expand to, to its maximum potential so when we operate this and fix these rib fractures the first and foremost thing is the pain relief is so much that the patient will not be complaining of pain in the everyday ward round the dose of analgesia can be reduced and the most important thing is the chest wall is realigned and we are giving more room for lung expansion the icu stay is obviously uh, reduced reduced the icu stay is reduced total uh, the cost of the hospital stay uh, is reduced uh, and these are all the important bits thank you thank you i think road traffic accidents uh, have you seen a increase in the number or the severity of them during this covid times uh, i think uh, i mean when compared to the normal average uh, the number of cases we had was uh, lesser but uh, in comparing uh, uh, to the Uh, to the moon in some times when nobody was coming out and everybody was sitting at home and doing this sort of uh, whatsapp chatting we had a significant number which means that many of the hospitals were not running and the only hospital which was providing uh, or the few hospitals which were providing service uh, cavery was one among them okay thank you thank you uh, i'll just uh, ask dr skanda the uh, second question Uh, Skanda, are you are online. Dr. Skanda. Yes, sir. I am online. I am online. Okay, okay, okay. You you delivered Hello? a lot of uh, yeah. Can you hear me, Hello? Skanda? Skanda, are you? Uh, can you hear sir, me now? Sir, I can hear you. Okay. Skanda. Uh, sir, I you... can hear you. I can hear you, sir. Yeah, yeah. Can you hear? yeah, yeah. I'm just going to ask a question, Dr. Skanda. Yes, sir. Okay. Replants during this uh, yes, COVID times. I think you have done more than six or seven of them. Yes. Replants. 
and you shown one of the uh, interesting replants in the finger implant yes sir. yes 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 but uh, tell me about the problems you faced during the school time yes sir Just the uh, reach between the time delay uh, the decision making issues uh, the covid screening how did it affect the reimplantation uh, uh, service you offered uh, to be very honest uh, uh, replant is a true emergency sir so personally we did not uh, look at the rt pcr status or anything in any of these cases so we proceeded assuming that the patient was covid positive so we probably i mean i personally for reasons that i mentioned earlier we use optics that tend to get heavily fogged so i cannot uh, you know wear a complete uh, personal protective uh, personal protective equipment and uh, uh, and uh, to use the optics again using the microscope becomes a very big problem so all i did use was an n95 mask nothing more otherwise i think it was pretty much like uh, what under normal times whatever the normal stress or uh, we did not find any uh, um, you know we did not find any gross difference so we've done quite a few replants and revascularizations in this period okay hats off hats off to you and uh, congratulations to your team thank you sir uh, thank i'm you, just sir. going to move on to dr hari for want of time dr skanda hari are you online thank you sir yes sir yes sir please hari um, uh, just uh, when all of us wanted to be away from the nose and the mouth uh, and keep our social distancing you had to uh, reach uh, these difficult areas uh, tell me what went through your mind and especially your family when you had to continue providing these services uh, how how did you feel emotionally did you feel supported and, and uh, how did the hospital support you so uh as you, as you rightly said sir being a ent surgeon we were fully exposed to the aerosol uh, but from the day one we didn't stop actually i didn't stop working so every day i had a seen a opd and uh, whatever cases were there we were just operating and as uh, the second question what you had the management has given me a good uh, support at the same support i got it from the family also uh, touch wood nothing happened to me or my family and uh, the thing is uh, considering the this one was the only thing which protects us is the protein uh, safety precautions sir so in a opd what i used to do is that any any procedure which needs a scopy better to wear a face shield below that one surgical mask below that will be the n95 that is wearing n95 mask over that uh, regular surgical mask over that one face shield and a gloves pair of gloves initially i used to wear a ppe but later stage so slowly we got uh lenient and which we should not supposed to but uh, scrub dress every day scrub dress and then wash the scrub dress before entering the room house uh, that is a usual routine sir and wear the mask n95 I, i used to keep it in the car so that uh, it won't be get exposed to the family members and then uh, and i don't use the car with the family and that car won't be used in for the family journeys everything so these are all the precautions which i followed but uh, but whatever precaution still it can happen but maximum what we can do is to protect ourselves by wearing a proper pp and the proper mask in a ty- timely situation that's the thing no you you showed us a spread of cases you have performed what is the most satisfying surgery uh, you remember during this covid time which was uh, which which one you remember that you felt very happy about so the happiest moment will be that foreign body patients sir because they come with the, this one that nobody had, had uh, given them hope that this will be done here or not actually the one foreign body metal foreign body they all the way uh, traveled from kadalu and nobody has told that okay this can be done or anything but uh, here the management has given me the support also so we took up the case and they were uh, they felt very happy and the child went on the second post of day and uh, the thing is but all the ot staffs everybody are and put under risk so which has been taken care by the by taking a swab and then swab came negative for me luckily for all the patients who had done i had done as a emergency uh, that that moment is really delightful so that one that uh, foreign body child thank you thank you for want of time we going to move on i'm going to move on to dr kulasekara yeah, dr kulasekara are you online yes sir now uh, uh, the thrombotic tendency which has been uh, largely talked about in uh, uh, in covid and uh, you are operating on this uh, on this difficult time uh, what additional risk uh, are these patients exposed to uh, in your coronary surgery in particular yeah so 
uh, we have operated around 13 patients now who had a COVID infection to come for surgeries later on. To be frank, we have not seen any thrombotic tendencies, anything unusual, because these patients report we have taken after two weeks, once the inflammatory markers, everything has settled down. Even then, to be on safer side, we put them all on a low dose heparin for five days. Okay, thank you, thank you. Waiting for surgery and, and uh, anxiety for a patient who is, uh, has a cardiac problem uh, and doubly uh, uh, enhanced by this COVID scare, uh, how, uh, how did you support your patients and their relatives during this difficult time? Uh, sure, sir. First thing is there is a fear of the patients getting COVID from the hospital atmosphere and uh, what is the effect of COVID on them? And uh, many had, uh, the, those things were in the early part of the epidemic. Later on, the public also has become more comfortable and we have also become more comfortable in doing the surgeries. If you, I have put the graph for the one year, for the first two yeah. months, especially this April and March, it has come down to 25% and then slowly it went up. Uh, so there is a, a public confidence also is there and we educate them very well about all the safety precautions to be taken and we screen them enough because cardiac surgery, as you have mentioned, it's a very high risk exposure surgery. We are just directly operating on the lungs with both pleuras open, patient in positive pressure ventilation for more than three to four hours. So we have to consider on both the sides. So we have taken a balanced approach. So all the conservatively managed patients are uh, postponed till the initial high epidemic period is over. Now we have started take our list is back to normal. I was showing in the curve that from December, we are back to the normal work. So there was thank a you. dip and where we have to take both the sides. Thank you, thank you. Hats off to uh, Dr. TSK and, and his team and uh, thank you for your uh, uh, excellent presentation. And for want of time, I'm going to move on to uh, Dr. Anis. Dr. Anis, are you, uh, are you online? Dr. Are Anis? You me? Yeah, yeah, yes, I can sir. hear you now. Yeah. Yes. Now, um, cancer is threatening to uh, the physical body as much uh, and uh, more to the mind. And now uh, the yes. COVID uh, additionally scared the people. Uh, what support system you had to uh, offer to these patients and the relatives? Uh, because these are all uh, complex surgeries, uh, major surgeries, yeah. and, uh, and there's a fear of the unknown of the future. Uh, how did you support them? Um, in fact, most of our patients are more worried about cancer than this uh, COVID. Uh, because as you said, uh, cancer is going to be a long-term uh, more harmful or a dangerous disease when compared to uh, COVID, which is uh, probably a very short-term uh, thing. So uh, even without COVID, we have a very good uh, support system for all these patients. And we have a, a dedicated... Uh, a psychologist uh, who immediately after diagnosis uh, counsels the patients and uh, counsels the attenders uh, because the cancer patient is not the disease alone it's the disease of the family actually uh, it, it affects the it affects them financially it affects them mentally and it affects them uh, physically it affects the entire family so uh, usually we have a, we have a dedicated uh, uh, psychologist uh, for counseling and we did the uh, same thing and uh, uh, the only issue was the travel uh, part because of the lockdown, uh, for which I, I would say most of the uh, government officials, the policemen uh, were kind enough. And whenever uh, we gave a proper uh, letter or something that patient is uh, on a, a cancer treatment, uh, they were allowed even without uh, sometimes the E-pass and other things. So uh, the counseling part is uh, very, very essential. And even without uh, COVID, uh, it's one of the very core uh, part of our uh, treatment uh, philosophy. Thank you, thank you. Um, and you uh, have definitely helped a lot of families. Which cancer did you feel uh, that uh, uh, by not postponing and operating on this high-risk COVID times, you felt very happy about? Do you remember a case which uh, you can share? Yeah, we, we had a couple of uh, uh, colonic uh, cancers with uh, evolving uh, obstructive uh, features. And uh, uh, that was very early in the April or May month where uh, we didn't have uh, enough uh, testing facilities and uh, other uh, things. Uh, we had to take that uh, small risk uh, to, to make the patient uh, better. 
and uh, i think we were uh, successful the patient is uh, we been treated well and uh, he is on follow up thank you thank you hats off to you and your team and uh, for want of time we going to move on to dr satyadev is dr satyadev online yes sir yes yes dr satyadev a nice presentation and uh, spread of uh, surgeries uh, in this uh, uh, young uh, uh, young patients and uh, uh, share your uh, experience about the uh, most satisfying surgery uh, among the many surgeries you have done uh, in this covid times dr satyadev Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Thank you for your words, sir. Um, all the surgeries were uh, like satisfying only, sir. But uh, during the COVID, uh, operating on COVID positive patient, uh, the support given by the pediatric team and the anesthetic team, uh, they didn't scare me about regarding the uh, the COVID positivity status. They were encouraged, encouraging to me, and uh, they gave the cases uh, immediately. A few cases uh, were. Um, the, both the cases, uh, the, the first case, uh, even uh, CT scan also was not done. Even RT PCR, nothing. We did because the patient was in shock. We immediately shifted uh, the patient from ER to the OT, and uh, we did the surgery. And uh, the swab was taken on the table only. So they were very cooperative, the anesthetist and the management also. I need to thank the management also. Uh, they were without uh, any scaring and. Uh, they gave the adequate uh, uh, protective uh, equipments and uh, ppe kits and uh, that that case was uh, very satisfying okay thank you thank you dr okay. satyadev i think um, we have to thank the pediatric team who have ably supported you led by uh, dr sengitwanda and dr, uh, dr suresh chellaya uh, and the intensivist dr sendil kumar uh, thank you very much i think we have come to this uh, uh, end of this uh, second uh, webinar uh, uh, of uh, surgery uh, during covid times i think um, uh, we have passed the initial uh, uh, initial phase of uh, uh, difficult decisions to uh, now more robust protocols and pathways where we uh, are able to uh, determine uh, the uh, risk of the patient risk of the surgeon uh, choose the appropriate ppe and uh, we have to thank the administration and the management who have uh, uh, who have continued to provide the necessary uh, support structure without which uh, uh, we would not have uh, ventured on to this uh, continuing service and uh, we have to thank the nursing staff and the allied healthcare staff uh, who have uh, supported uh, all the patients and the relatives and the healthcare staff uh, doctors and surgeons uh, to provide this uh, service uh, to the patients and uh, as uh, as already one of the speakers mentioned uh, dr kulasekar mentioned covid uh, 19 is not over yet the pandemic is still on and uh, we would continue to uh, deliver the service uh, as much as we should thank you uh, thank you one and all and thank you all the participants who stayed uh, all the way through this uh, presentation i think uh, i have seen the numbers uh, have not dipped from the beginning to the end all the participants are continuing to listen uh, until the end and i thank all the participants for making this webinar a huge success thank you very much have a uh, have a uh, uh, good night to everyone thank you thank you